what's the story with Jerry Lawler's 74 banishment from Memphis? Actually, it uh, in my book, Tuesday Night at the Gardens, uh, Pro Wrestling in Louisville, <laughs> it, it gives uh, the story from at least Jerry Jarrett's side. And, and to be honest, I, I don't know that I've heard Jerry, uh, Jerry Lawler uh, uh, disagree with this. Jerry had been when when Lawler and and Jim White were a tag team and Sam Bass was their was made their manager in Memphis for their first big run where they started setting records. Um, as a matter of fact, it, it was probably late 1972 that Lawler and White were first put together as partners, and they broke in and spent some time in Alabama, Mississippi, down there. But then also they were sent over to the eastern part of the state of Tennessee, over to the Knoxville territory. And they spent some time there, kind of you know getting their shit together, and then they were called back over to Memphis and they were put on top. Well, at that time, unless you were Ron Wright or Whitey Caldwell, uh, you weren't really figured in to make a lot of money in East Tennessee. And so then when all of a sudden Lawler and White become the top team and they set all those attendance records and then Lawler gets the, the singles push and he has the match with Briscoe for the world title in Memphis. He's only 22 years old. He's one of the top 10 box office attractions in the country. He, uh, at the end of uh, the year, 1974, he went to Jerry Jarrett. And he said, hey, have you got me booked in Johnson City, Tennessee next week? And Jarrett said, well, I haven't got it done yet, but why? He said, well, don't book me because I ain't going. Because it was 500 miles from Memphis, and, and you didn't make a lot of money over there. Well, that wasn't allowed back in those days because <laughs> you couldn't have this guy, even if he was making a whole lot of money and drawing a whole lot of money, you couldn't have the guys telling the booker or the promoter where they were going to go and where they weren't going to go. And Jerry Jarrett apparently decided he would nip it in the bud right then, so Lawler's push evaporated. He did a lot of jobs. He was switched babyface for a brief run, did a lot of jobs on the way out, and then was sent down to work uh, underneath in Georgia and Florida for six to nine months, and he came back and was put right back on top in Memphis and had a whole lot better at attitude about the towns he was going to make or not make. <laughs> and, and you know, that's the story that I've, I've always heard and that Jerry has told and that I tend to believe because everything fits. Um, you know, having said that, uh, that's, that's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's the difference in, in those days and today, uh, when Jerry Jarrett was on my podcast here, not long ago, I asked him what would have happened if he'd have been in charge of the click instead of Vince McMahon, if Jerry, if you had four top guys that you were paying a fortune to and payoffs, whether they'd drawn money or not, and they were drawing money. But they not only would tell you that they would put so-and-so over and they wouldn't put so-and-so over. They'd make such-and-such -such data. They wouldn't make such-and-such -such date. And they would go out in your biggest arena in front of a sellout crowd and hug each other and expose the business because they wanted everybody to know that they were in the same little clique. What would you do? And he answered it would be just like Jim the day after they shot President Kennedy. We would get up and we would be sorry that they were gone, but life would continue. <laughs> well, and that's and that's the way that every promoter used to think and that's why that the business ran very efficiently <laughs> with a few hiccups for 100 years and then all of a sudden guys started thinking they were bigger than the business and promoters started letting them get away with it and it went to hell in a handbasket real quick 